And this is called deadly, right? I think just deadly because um, it was deadly, the search for typhoid Mary, and people seemed to be confused uh, if it was nonfiction or fiction. So just oh, deadly oh, oh. makes it fiction. All right, you got it. Okay. September 7th, 1906. I know that one day I won't be on this earth anymore. A world without the physical me. What will that look like? I'll seep down into the soil, become a plant, a tree. I'll be falling leaves, yellow, crunching under a child's feet until I am dust. Nothing. Gone. Every September, the shivers come over me. Thoughts of my brother's terrifying death and the questions. Why did his short life end? Why do people have to die? I write here trying to explain each word a stepping stone. These words illuminate my past. They bring me forward to the future. They help me remember. Without my writing, I would suffer an emptiness worse than I feel now. Today there are great holes in me. I feel like a secret observer, separate from everything that goes on around me. Peering from my window just above the storefronts of this creaky building on Ludlow Street where I've lived since the morning of my birth, I watch Mrs. Zanberger at the vegetable cart below. She argues with Miss Lara over the price of onions the way she does every Sunday. Behind her, Kat Radlikoff drags her heavy skirt through the mud, her belly swollen, her husband hiding in the shadows of their room. In front of the grocer, Ruth Schmidt smiles under her patched parasol, parasol at Iggy Moskowitz, who works too hard to notice her. I see the Feldman sisters from upstairs chasing each other through the puddles like boys, with finally a morning free from the factory. Under the butcher's canopy, their mothers talk with other mothers from the neighborhoods the neighborhood, their faces dark with worry. I know them, these girls and women. I've seen their families grow. They've seen mine get smaller. When I'm in their company, I listen to them trade recipes and sewing tips. I smile at their gossip about each other, yet I can't find a word to add. My eyes get stuck on the sadness in their mouths or their red chapped hands and suddenly I'm imagining their lives, what they dream about when no one is looking, or what they might be like with fewer children. The women talk around and over me. Somehow I feel like I'll always be looking at them through a distant window. Even at school I feel this. When classes started this week, I had in my mind the birth I'd attended with Marm the night before. Sophie, Ger Sophie Gersh came due around midnight, and her mother pounded at our door, her fear thrusting us from our beds. Marm and I rushed after the frightened woman, running full gallop the two blocks to her daughter's apartment, where the girl's husband stood outside, wringing his hands, and she lay keening in the bedroom like a poor abandoned child. I took my place at the head of the bed, where so I held Sophie's hand and wiped the sweat from her teary eyes and assured her the birth would be good, that all would, be, would come out as we planned. Below, Mar Marm did her magic. Sophie's water broke. She was ready. Working together, the three of us encouraged her baby to come forth into this world. His birth happened easily, a miracle, one of those rare times when Marm and I can clean up the infant and hand him to his mother and happily return to our own beds. We napped an hour before rising to face the day, which was my first day of school. My schoolmates kissed. We don't see each other through the summer months. The girls had matured, their faces and bodies grown longer or fatter. I smiled at Josephine, who had become impossibly taller and thinner and prettier, and Fanny, whose round face had finally found its cheekbones. I brushed their cheeks with my lips. I searched their eyes for the start to a conversation. I wanted to tell them about the birth or Benny, but Josephine started talking about her new job at the perfume counter at Macy's. She described the glamorous ladies who bought the most expensive ounces, the delicate fabrics they wore, their jewels and dogs. She didn't stop until Mrs. Browning came in with stout Miss Rubin, our teacher for the year. My heart dropped when I saw it was her. Miss Rubin's eyes swept the room imperiously and settled on me. She said, girls, I see that some of you are still lacking in the most basic charms. We must correct that situation now. This is your last year before you are released into the world. There is no time left to waste. I turned my eyes away from her and concentrated on the smoke I could see puffing from the stack of the building next door. My stomach soured at the thought of spending my last year with her. Miss Rubin hasn't liked me since the third grade. 
she she's exploring her difference. You know, she's just constantly comparing herself to the outer world and just feeling yeah. so. Is it you, in the diary form? You sort of it's all in her head too. Right. So the whole search for typhoid Mary is in her head too, and she's analyzing it. And 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 there's a lot of. Um, problems with it because she um, I, Mary is an immigrant an Irish immigrant and at the time they you know they were the dirty Irish and right. so there's this thing uh, is she this new thing called a healthy carrier which is someone who carries disease without actually having the disease uh, or is she or are they discriminating against her because she's Irish um, you know Prudence is a Jew she knows the dirty Jew uh, epithet. You know, she's, she's experienced in, in these things. So she's, she's always weighing the morality of things or the, the science of things. Or she, but she's sort of a kid, right? But she's a kid. So it's, it's a coming of age. I mean, her innocence is being constantly tested. And, and uh, you know, she's learning so many new things. Uh, there's also the the way that you um, you set up her relationship. Like, I'm just going to fast forward through plot and stuff. <laughs> that it, that she uh, she ends up wanting to become uh, a doctor, and it, and it's so out of the realm of imagination for the whole culture around her, including her mother, who's actually a midwife. A midwife. Uh, that they're sort of shocked and they're saying, oh no, but you've got to learn how to do stenography, right? And she's in that school where Mrs. What's her name Mrs. is, right? Mrs. Browning's and, school um, for girls. She won't give the girl a break right. to go, what, there's, a, there's a lab job or something yeah, she can do, right? Yeah, she finally gets a job. She, she, her desire is to, to find a job that will um, let her fight death because she's experienced so much death. And uh, she works. She gets a job in the Department of Health, working for the the head epidemiologist who hunts down these these epidemics of diseases, being his note taker because her handwriting is very good. And and that's and the she only also way. does a lot of drawings in the book. And, and that's the and only way she could get into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, uh, now we got about four minutes left. Ah. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, you've got the uh, some of the drawings, the mock-ups you're going to use for this book. You want to talk about how you decided which ones would work in the book? Well, um, these drawings, I don't know. We're, we'll like try to, to put them okay. up. But um, the, they, uh, they they're done by an artist named Jean-Marc Superville Sobek, who um, drew as this 16-year-old girl, and he just did. He went. He read through the book, and he just drew what he felt she might draw, not not directly of the book, but outside of the book. What what she's seeing in the world, or some anatomy that she'd be fascinated with, or what a germ might look like, or a microscope, because she loves these these things. Uh, so they add a whole other layer, a visual layer to the book that you wouldn't get, uh, and it helps you to imagine that time period and. To see what and understand what she's seeing, what Prudence yeah. is seeing. It, it reminds me what John Gardner did with a couple of his books. He had an illustrator. A lot of. Uh, and, and you know, uh, Ir Irving did this too with a couple of books, I think. Oh uh, really? Where they had pencil, basically. Uh, yeah. And not a lot of them, but right. Just interesting period pieces or something right. that somehow gave you a feeling for the time. Right. Yeah. The. Um, uh, the other thing that this character does, which I find fascinating, I don't know how you lay off this, but the romantic development, um, where she starts to come into womanhood and has to deal with these younger men. They're not younger than she is, but they're young men oh, right. who are working in the lab, and there's all these rules. Like, you're not supposed to look at them, they aren't supposed to look at you, they aren't supposed to talk to you. So she's in this little box the whole time. I mean, there's an Anne Frankness about it. Uh, it, it just all these limitations, and yet there's this burgeoning growth inside, this curiosity, this, you know, this kind of voluptuous character growing. Well, she falls in love with her boss. Too. Yeah, and she <laughs> and, and becomes very protective, and and he, uh, there's a sense that he really reciprocates it in a way, but but he can't, you know, right. it's like, and and it's just really stilted.